Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're here to talk about the Malaysian electoral tsunami, which hit three weeks ago today, uh, taking the world by surprise, certainly us by surprise. Um, you know, in previous elections, UMNO had been steadily losing the popular, popular support in the elections. It had lost uh, in its coalition um, with uh, Barisan Nasional, had lost its two-thirds majority in the general election 12 um, and uh, in, in, in 2009, I believe, and it lost the popular vote in uh, GE 13 in 2013. Um, but, but it really took, you know, the Najib government had so effectively jerry-rigged the system through gerrymandering and other things that it was widely expected that even with a further loss of popular support, it would be able to hang on to power. But that didn't happen, and in fact, uh, the Alliance of Hope, uh, the Pakatan Harapan uh, uh, coalition, uh, swept into power. Prime Minister uh, Mahathir was sworn in as prime minister, and uh, Anwar Ibrahim was released from prison, and they are now talking about um, a, a, a power-sharing arrangement that will lead to Anwar being um, uh, handed over the reins in a year or two. So the big questions we wanted to focus on today were, you know, how did this happen? Why did this happen? Uh, surprising everyone's expectations. And what comes next for Malaysia uh, in its domestic politics and its foreign policy and, and economy? So we really wanted to do this event uh, because it's such a timely and important topic with big implications looking into the future. Um, and we also, we at CSIS will be doing a lot of work on U.S.-Malaysia relations this year uh, on a very exciting project that uh, Ambassador Joe Yoon is part of. So this was a really great way to kick off some of our thinking about Malaysia and where it's headed. And I, we have two really terrific uh, speakers here to participate in this conversation. Um, to my right is Dr. Meredith Weiss, who is a professor of political science and the director of the international programs at the Rockefeller College of Public Affairs and Policy at the State University of New York at Albany. And she's published widely on political mobilization and contention, the politics of identity and development, and electoral politics in Southeast Asia, with a particular focus on Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, her books include Student Activism in Malaysia, Crucible, Mirror, and Sideshow, 2011, publication, and Protest and Possibilities, Civil Society and Coalitions for Political Change in Malaysia, published in 2006. And she has a forthcoming book that explores the resilience of electoral authoritarian politics in Malaysia and Singapore. And she's also done research and is editing a collaborative volume on the current, uh, the recent election in Malaysia. So she, and she's just back from Malaysia. Uh, she was there last week. So she has a lot of fresh perspectives on what went down. Um, and to my left, we have uh, a well-known figure in this town uh, in Asia circles, Ambassador Joseph Yoon. He served as U.S. Ambassador to Malaysia from 2013 to 2016. He most recently served concurrently as the U.S. Special Representative for North Korea Policy and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Korea and Japan in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. He's also had many other senior postings, including Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in EAP, and his overseas postings have included uh, in Korea, Thailand, France, Indonesia, and Hong Kong. And he ser currently serves as Senior Advisor at the Asia Group and Senior Advisor at the U.S. Institute of Peace. So we're going to open up with uh, five or ten minutes of remarks from each of our speakers, and then we'll have a, a discussion about the election and its implications. But let me first turn to Joe. Thank you very much, Amy, and thanks. It's nice to see so many familiar faces, and it's nice not to talk about North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> no questions on North Korea, please. <laughs> and, uh, and especially delighted uh, Meredith could be with us. She's the real expert, of course, you know, on, on all the political issues. So, so save your tough questions for her. <laughs> you know? Not that yeah. easy. Yeah. I mean, I was in Malaysia, I guess, uh, about a month and a half ago. And uh, even at that time, there was no expectation that this could happen. 
anyone who predicted it, except of course Meredith, is lying. You know, uh, <laughs> because we could not have predicted it. And to me, this is the best possible development in Southeast Asia, where we have seen so many countries kind of retreat from transparency, from democracy, rule of law, and so Malaysia for a change is, is really leading the charge in this and uh, I'm delighted uh, that it has happened this way. And as I look back, you know, because I was so convinced uh, uh, Barisan BN would win, you know, I look at what was one key factor uh, why BN won and I have to put it so, uh, media, social networking, you know? Uh, to me, because I was getting a lot of messages, to me, that was the critical factor. In all previous elections, the media profile was so unfair between the ruling party and the opposition. But, you know, your you know, internet-based newspapers, blogging and everything, I think made it, you know, not quite equal still. But, but almost there. So, but more critically, is this off the record or on the record? Yeah, more critically, it's, it's on, it's the, on record. the record, all right. More critically, <laughs> I think there was no opportunity for the ruling party to implement Plan B once they realized votes were going against them, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and Plan B, I'll leave it up to your imagination what Plan B might have been, but because it was so out in the open uh, mm -hmm. in social media, there was nothing they could do except to concede. Mm -hmm. And you can see the surprise in uh, uh, Omno circles, especially Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Najib, he wasn't prepared. I was just informed they took out, you know, over 200 handbags, you know, I mean, you've got to be better prepared than that, <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> and so, and, and, and for that reason, I don't think Pakatan Harapan was particularly prepared either, you know, uh, but things moved very rapidly. And, uh, you know, we saw uh, Mahathir obviously sworn in. Uh, thereafter, formation of so-called Council of Elders, or what they call in Malaysia, the Jedi Council, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then the formation of uh, cabinet and so on. So for me, of course, our main interest, uh, what, what does the government stand for? You know, what does it look like? And, you know, it is a strange mixture. You know, uh, we have Defense Minister Mat Sabu. I don't think he's ever seen a soldier in his life, <laughs> you, know? Uh, it's, it's, you know? On the record, all right, yeah. <laughs> you know? and, and, then, and then, but we have some very, very knowledgeable guys, like, uh, uh, like Finance Minister Lim Guaneng, mm -hmm. who is very competent. And, uh, and Muhyiddin, you know, who knows thing or two. And then weird, back to the old days, dime, you know, uh, kind of in the mix. And so I think it's going to be a kind of a, you know, a messy experiment for a while. And we should expect that. Mm -hmm. I mean, for us, of course, the main interests are on foreign policy. And number one, what does it mean for the United States? Uh, I think, I mean, I met Mah uh, Mahathir a few times, and I do think he's mellowed in his old age, and he's getting on a bit, you know, uh, and, and, and so I don't think he has such angst against the U.S. that he used to have, and certainly I think uh, he's, he has a more balanced view of China, uh, so I do think there will be a little bit of balancing. I certainly, if there are any of my former state colleagues here, would recommend that we try for an early summit, get Mahathir over to Washington, uh, and uh, have a real discussion with him. And he would like it. I mean, you know, uh, 
uh, when I was ambassador, I talked to him. And as a, just an elder figure, I asked him whether he would go to Washington. He was very, very open to that. Mm -hmm. Certainly, that's, you know, it, that's the biggest thing we could do. Uh, in terms of rebalancing against China, we'll have to wait and see. Bhatia is also very, very pro-business, uh, very pro-business. And same with Anwar. Anwar, I think, especially you saw that when he was in deputy for finance, uh, deputy prime minister and finance minister. I mean, he was very sensible about macroeconomics, budget, exchange rate, role of state. So I don't really so much on that kind of macroeconomic policies, especially with Dr. Zeti in that you know uh, Jedi Council. Uh, and, and, but more worrisome would be, I think, state-owned enterprises, in my view. What happens to state-owned enterprises, because they're a huge part, ranging from big ones like Felder, Petronas, you know? Mm -hmm. And a lot of them really quite abused by the political party at the time. And then, you know, what happens to big projects? We've already seen uh, high-speed rail talked about being canceled. I don't know whether it is, you know, again, like anywhere else, talk is cheap there, you know, uh, whether it will really be canceled. So those things I think we have to be mindful. But I do think it is an opportunity for the United States, especially given our traditional connection with ANWA, what we stand for, our values, democracy, rule of law, and so on. So we have some tricky items to maneuver through, the main one being 1MDB, you know, how should DOJ work with the uh, Attorney General's office in the investigation. I think that's going to be much more of a challenge than it was under Najib. So why don't I leave it yeah, there, Amy, great. and then, Thank uh, you. And, and Thanks, then Ambassador. Go on. Okay. Dr. Weiss? Okay. Um, so I'll go through just very quickly the key results for those who don't have those yet. Um, key drivers and why none of us, including me, predicted this. Uh, and then just some implications or things to watch, mostly just to throw out ideas we can follow up on in a Q&A. Uh, so for the results, I'll break these into the peninsula and East Malaysia because they're really different politically. On the peninsula, the Pakatan Harapan Coalition, which is Bursatu, Mahathir's party, uh, the Democratic Action Party, DAP, uh, Amana, which is an offshoot from, from PAS, the Islamist party, uh, and Ka'adilan, which is Anwar's party. Um, they got 79 seats on the peninsula. Um, of those, the important thing to note is that Bursatu only had 13, Mahathir's party. But they have the prime ministership, uh, the a deputy prime ministership, one of two, uh, and he doubles as home minister, which is the key portfolio, and three of their seven states, uh, Mentri Basar's chief ministers. Mm -hmm. So that's a real overrepresentation. Uh, Ka'adilan um, uh, had 47 seats, DAP had 42, and Amana had 11. The BN had a total of only 50 seats in the peninsula. PAS had 18. So for those of you who followed the Invoke surveys, uh, Rafizi's surveys, he predicted a complete wipeout. That did not happen. Uh, and then there's one independent on the peninsula who joined Ka'adilan. He's only 22, I think. Uh, last minute add-on. Um, for East Malaysia, which is Saban Sarawak, Pakatan in conjunction with Warisan, uh, which is Shafi's party, an offshoot from UMNO, essentially, had 24 seats. Eight of those are Warisan, but the rest are not. Um, and a couple of independents have since joined, or a couple of others have since leaped to uh, that coalition. The BN had 29 seats, and others or independents had three seats. <clears throat> so the sum total, including that one peninsular independent who's now Ka'adilan, 114 seats for Pakatan, 122 if we include Warisan as their partner. The BN has only 79, and PAS has 18. In terms of vote share, uh, these data for Malaysia are always weirdly inconsistent. So so what I've seen is anywhere from 34 to 36% of votes for the BN. Um, that's down from anywhere between 47 and 49%, probably closer to 47 last time. Um, Pakatan had 48% plus another 2% for Warisan, and PAS had 17%. In terms of states, Pakatan controls essentially all of the west and the south of the peninsula. Um, so that's uh, Penang, Kedah, Selangor, Negeri Sembilan, Malacca, Johor, and Parak. Uh, Parak was only because two BN uh, state legislators have put their support, they haven't jumped parties, but they've put their support behind the Pakatan uh, chief minister, MB. 
the BN only has two peninsular states, Perlis and Pahang. Perlis is tiny, Pahang is Najib state. PAS controls the entire Northeast, essentially, with Trangano and Kelantan. They have almost nothing below northern Perak. They do not seep down into the peninsula. And then Warisan, together with Pakatan, controls Sabah, um, while, while the BN still, for now, has Sarawak. But the Sarawak BN, which is completely state-based parties, um, has talked of, they haven't done it yet, but they've talked of separating out into its own purely state-specific BN. We have now really four blocks. It is a quadrupolar electorate. So we have Pakatan, Amno, PAS, and then East Malaysia. With East Malaysia, not a really coherent block, but certainly not something like the peninsula. OK, so key drivers. Most important, this was less a sudden surge than a culmination of a long-term process. I'm not fully in agreement with the language of a tsunami or an earthquake or whatever else. The opposition had won a majority of the popular vote last time. There have been a long history of different coalition attempts dating back really to the 1960s, but certainly since, since the Reformasi period of the late 1990s. We have many of the same key players. It's just some of those key players now were previously in government. Um, and so uh, a lot of civil societal efforts that have been going on for a long time continue. So if we see this in that light, we get a better sense of perspective, I think, on what specific tipping effect Mahathir had, for instance. The key issue in this election, as every other in Malaysia, is economics. So if you look at surveys of you know, what's the number one priority that voters state, um, going back through the years, it's always economics. But economic voting in Malaysia is not quite the same as economic voting elsewhere. It's not a question of you know, the standard US census or survey question of, is your economic position better or worse than it was at this point four years ago? In Malaysia, if it's worse, that might mean you still vote for the government because they're the ones who have the power to give you some targeted benefit. And if you're Malay and there's a, a multiracial coalition or a non-Malay dominated coalition or a non-communal coalition on the other side, your interests because of affirmative action may still be served by that flight to safety of sticking with the BN. So to say economics matters doesn't really tell you very much, just that that's what mattered to people. Um, the issues were a cost of living, the goods and services tax, which had been implemented in 2015, only 6%, but most Malaysians did not pay any taxes, so that was important, um, and fuel subsidies. Um, so fuel prices had been just up and down. It is not that the BN's goodies, all of these, you know, Najib's last speech was this carnival, carnival barker type discussion of, you know, no tax for anyone under 26 and we'll refund last year's too and, you know, we'll have these jobs and this and that. You know, it's not that those things didn't matter. It's that the cost of living increases, many thought, had outpaced the handouts that they were getting on the one hand and that some of those things, the other side, Pakatan was also offering. So many of the subsidies, many of the so-called populist policies pretty much balanced out between the two coalitions. Um, and indeed, just today I saw news that civil the civil service is asking Pakatan to honor the goodies that, that Barisan had po promised them, the extra bonuses. All right, second issue, corruption. Corruption hadn't really seemed to be a big issue. Um, the surveys running up to the election and the, the years since the last election had shown little change in perceptions of corruption. Some around 40% thought it was a big problem. And also little change in the fact that a majority thought that the government would not tackle corruption effectively. So that's, that's consistent. As of 2015, which was the last survey I've been able to get on 1MDB, the big handle. So this was after it was all over the news. 69% said that they were barely aware of it or not aware at all um, of, of that. Um, so that's awareness. And then 49% said that their understanding of it was nil. Only 23% said that they actually understood what it was about. And only a minority were even a little bit confident that the government would handle it. So this was basically not an issue. People didn't think it would be addressed, but they also didn't know what it was. Um, I think what mattered in terms of why corruption became more of an issue was that the opposition got better at translating that into household economics, especially making the GST matter as an electoral issue by saying the reason for this GST is a debt that 1MDB has, ha has incurred. And there are all sorts of ways that we saw this in campaign speeches. Um, there are also other scandals which mattered for specific population groups. The one I'll mention specifically is Felda, the huge IPO for Felda uh, Golden Ventures. This is a uh, Malay reserved land started under the British and expanded. That segment of the vote, they're on, they're on government land, essentially, Malay smallholders. That segment has always been an absolutely fixed BN constituency, and they split this time. Um, all right, um, and it's not that people weren't, didn't have access to information. Malaysia has near complete smartphone coverage, internet access, but mainstream media didn't cover these, these sorts of uh, scandals. 
All right, race-based politics. There's always some element of communalism, but it mattered less or mattered differently this time. On the one hand, uh, the MCA, the Malaysian Chinese Association, went with probably a misguided strategy of highlighting their links with China specifically. Um, it's not that there was such anti-China sentiment, but rather some of what's usually anti-Chinese sentiment as, oh no, you know, the DAP, the opposition party, will bring Chinese leadership to Malaysia, now came to seem more on the BN side of, wait, we've got Xi Jinping on campaign posters of the BN, what's, what's that saying? Um, and so I think that that shifted the timbre a little bit. Not necessarily in a good way, but a different way. Um, a, a larger issue was that Bursatu, Mahathir's party, is an overtly communal party. It is, in Mahathir's own words, supposed to bring UMNO back to its roots. For those of you familiar with uh, Samangat and Papulunam, the earlier, the Samangat 46 coalition, the party in the 1980s, it's that again, you know, sort of the new version of, of UMNO. It is not different in its goals. And I think that that increased confidence among Malay voters in particular, that they would not necessarily risk losing Malay privileges if they voted for the opposition. The leader of both coalitions was securely Malay, and Malay rights, the sort of NEP legacy policies, were likely to continue. It's not entirely clear the premise on which they will continue. Anwar has said he prefers need-based, but it doesn't look like a big change. And then the last thing in terms of race-based politics, because Mahathir's party, Bursatu, was denied registration, the opposition ran under a unified logo. That obscured which party anyone was running under. The DAP, Chinese-based party traditionally in particular, had recruited some really excellent young Malay candidates they had trouble when they went out with their initial campaign materials with the DAP logo because the rocket, their logo, is seen as a Chinese thing. When they went out under the unified Pakatan logo, nobody knew what party they were from. So, the, so those candidates did really well. Um, and so that really helped them. Okay, next, next issue is personalities. This is a pretty obvious one. The last election, uh, 2013, was seen as a presidential one. Najib was everywhere. His posters were all over Malaysia. Less this time, for not, not surprisingly, and Rosma was absent entirely. Um, Mahathir was even more popular, even in Johor, our, the people we spoke with said that he was more popular than Muhyiddin, who's from Johor. Um, and some of that seemed to be just, wow, at 92, you know, Lee Kuan Yew had said he'd come back from the grave to save Malaysia, or to save Singapore, not Malaysia, he doesn't care about that, <laughs> to save Singapore. This was Mahathir's version of that, but he's not yet in the grave, so he was able to do it. Um, and so I think especially, um, you know, that sort of rhetoric of my country is in danger, I will save it, I think that helped. I don't think it's blind feudal sentiment. I think that there were really key ways in which his role shifted the discourse. But it's also the glory days, much as in Indonesia you see that, oh, remember the good old days of Suharto when we were growing rapidly and the rupiah was worth something? Mahathir could count on that same sort of rhetoric. So I think there was a lot of that. Um, media. WhatsApp, Facebook, all of those really helped to amplify opposition messages. The opposition, both sides use social media. This isn't a one-sided thing. But the opposition did a much better job of things like publicizing their events during the campaign and making it easy for people to get to them and see them. Uh, the other really interesting add-on this time, which have, has happened before but not to this extent, were videos, which were everywhere. With the most pivotal one, some of you may have seen, Mahathir's tearful one, crying to his grandkids about how, I need to save my country, and it's, it's very moving. It's, the music's a little much, but you know. <laughs> okay, manipulation. Should help the, the BN, but I think it actually worked against them in two ways. Um, so the scale of it was too much. The gerrymandering, but also the Wednesday polls. Putting the polls on a Wednesday hadn't happened in a couple decades, uh, to, to have a weekday poll. Uh, there was an immediate backlash, a huge public petition, such that the government then had to go against what they had said and make it a public holiday. Um, and turnout was 83%. It was 85% last time. This was hardly a drop. That was shocking. One of the reasons a lot of us had not predicted a Pakatan win beforehand was that leading up to the election, both sides were so disorganized that it wasn't clear that anyone could get enough energy going for people to care to get to the polls. There was this undi rosak, a spoiled ballot movement among younger voters and so forth. That dissipated. And a lot of it was because it was so clear that they were desperate. That made a difference. The other manipulation issue, PAS. So PAS contested in 160 seats, much more than it normally would. Um, the, pretty, the evidence is fairly clear that they were supported by UMNO in doing so. Um, in fact, people from UMNO would say this. Uh, people from PAS did not, for obvious reasons. Um, but the fact that they were able to, that, that does suggest that they had financial support. That was supposed to hurt the opposition by splitting the opposition vote, vote. In point of fact, it seems at least as much, if not more, looking at split seats, to have pulled votes away from UMNO. 
And so that bit of manipulation actually hurt Umno more than it hurt Pakatan. Um, and then why this was not predict predicted, there was a late surge among Malays. Um, it's not clear if people made up their minds late or if they just had felt com uncomfortable revealing their preferences, much as it happened in the US. Um, about one third on surveys generally give a don't know or don't answer response. Turnout was higher, split votes hurt UMNO, um, early, po early and postal votes, those are military and police, actually divided rather than being fully unified for BN this time. And then Sabah and Sarawak went for the opposition much more heavily than anyone expected. All right, so I'm just going to throw out a list of what to watch. Um, neither coalition was unified going in. The BN, for all intents and purposes, is now just gone. I, I don't predict that the BN will come back. Um, no, yes, the coalition is a wreck. Uh, the MCA is talking about becoming an NGO. Um, POS, yeah, POS is very much alive, but it is not a kingmaker. It will have power in Tranganu and Klantan, but it will not be able to assert its will at the federal level. POS's Hudud policies and other policies have split the opposition coalition twice already, I do not think that they will risk that again. Um, Race-based politics, something to watch. Um, what happens to NET, NEP politics and affirmative action, whether these become merit-based or stay with the current Bumiputra focus. Um, I do think the handover to Anwar will happen um, once the initial head lopping has been done. There is a wealth of young policy-oriented uh, uh, Pakatan leaders, so there definitely is depth there. There's also the Robert Kwok at 95 on that, that Jedi Council. There's Dime, there are others. But I think they actually have the, the depth of leadership there. Corruption cases will be investigated. And yes, it will be heavy-handed, as we're seeing so far. Uh, economics, I, I think I, I agree that Mahathir is, is incredibly business-oriented. He is known for his mega projects, so lopping off too many of those is unlikely. I think he will go ahead with canceling the, the high-speed the high rail link to Singapore. He's announced that. Singapore has accepted the decision. It's, it's a white elephant. It's not, it's not a really viable investment. The East Coast Rail Link, on the other hand, my guess is that they'll renegotiate with China to bring the price down. But PAS has already said, no, please continue with that. That's a vote bank that the opposition, that, that Pakatan would like. So I think that that will continue. A lot of the other investments, Chinese investments in particular, are far enough along that if they were to be cut now, or if the conditions were to be changed too much, we would risk having really high vacancy rates and real problems. Um, so I think there'll be more open tender and scrutiny, but not a huge change of, of practice. In terms of these so-called populist policies, um, th those have always happened and will continue to happen. That's what wins votes. You know, sort of targeted, credit-taking opportunities. And then the last thing I'll say, liberalization, Joe already mentioned. Those are the easiest changes. Getting rid of the worst of the laws, opening up the media, relaxing controls on universities. Those things, I think, will happen, and that will make a big difference. I don't have great expectations that the whole timbre of government will change, or that this will no longer be a competitive authoritarian system, as we call it. I think we'll just have a different coalition in power. But some of the worst aspects will change, and some of the worst of the corruption will stop. So that, on balance, is good, but I do think we should temper our optimism of much more. Thank you. Um, let me turn to both of you with a, with a couple of questions, and then we'll open it up uh, for discussion. Um, Joe, you talked about the reaction of the United States and your advice that uh, President Trump should seek an early summit. I wonder if you could uh, share a little more your thoughts about the, uh, the game plan of the United States. I mean, after the election, there was a statement put out by the White House that said all the right things, welcoming you know, the Democratic outcome and everything. But, um, but the, I haven't seen a huge response other than a statement from the White House. We haven't seen any visits yet. Maybe some are in the works. Um, I, I haven't seen any reporting of a phone call from President Trump when he's very fond of calling leaders uh, we know, including in Southeast Asia. Uh, and Mahathir said the other day in an interview with the Financial Times that he's not interested in meeting with Trump because Trump is so unpredictable. He doesn't know how to do business with him. Um, so, given all of that, I just wonder if you could, you know, if, right. you, if you could share your uh, wisdom, uh, uh, wise advice about how we should think about moving forward with Malaysia. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is a tough one because you know I don't speak for the government anymore, as as you know. So, so I'm <laughs> going to be frank with you. Uh, I I think we have <laughs> neglected this account. We've ne neglected this account, and the ASEAN account as a whole, you know, both Southeast Asia and Malaysia. And, uh, and, and, and so I think United States is at its best 
when we engage. And it's not that difficult to engage Southeast Asia. I do think uh, our senior folks, like uh, Secretary Pompeo, uh, Mr. Bolton, needs to be a lot more forthcoming mm -hmm. uh, in inviting uh, leaders from Southeast Asia mm -hmm. and a lot more forthcoming in going to visit. There is nothing like big visits to bring the relationship together. And there are so many things that we can do together, mm -hmm. you know, ranging from trade and investments to civil society and all these things that we do well. Mm -hmm. So this is why I recommend we have the highest possible meeting, which is a summit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one more question for you, Joe. Um, the 1MDB scandal, mm -hmm. you, you, um, mm -hmm. you talked about the role of the US Treasury yeah. mm -hmm. in that. I mean, in hindsight, although I guess Dr. Weiss has a slightly different take on this, but um, it, it, it does appear to many that the the impact of the scandal had a lot more resonance with voters in their concern about Malaysia's international reputation uh, and the, 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 the scandal, the uh, investigation was really led by the U.S. Treasury. Mm -hmm. yep. So two questions about that. One is, in hindsight, do you think it was a mistake for President Trump to invite Prime Minister Najib to the, to the White House, mm -hmm. given this dynamic uh, that ended up um, with voters rejecting him? Um, and the other question is, uh, you, you said a few words about the U.S. Treasury, but what, what is your sense about what the next steps will be um, from the U.S. Treasury on this issue? Yeah. No, I don't think it was a mistake to invite Najib. We show the respect of the office, and that's what we should do consistently, and that's why I think we should invite uh, Prime Minister Mahathir. On 1MDB, I have a little bit of different take than... Uh, mm -hmm than Mary does, that I think is a huge effect. He had a huge electoral effect. Mm. Uh, I do think, I mean, obviously, Mahathir moving to opposition was caused by 1MDB, mm. as was Muhyiddin, Shafi Abdal, mm. all of them, you know? Mm -hmm. So whatever, you know, you know awareness or non-awareness mm -hmm. among the population, uh, this was a tsunami. Uh, it was, you know, the eye of the storm, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, as far as uh, the election went. And, the, you know, the role of uh, vilifying Rosma, Najib, uh, all that I think was crucial mm -hmm. in, in Mahathir's participation. His, you know, appealing to, to save the country, I think all that was, 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 mm -hmm. was, was, was really proximate cause. On where we go from here, I do think this will speed up. I mean, as you know, I, I have heard that, you know, uh, former Attorney General Ghani is now back mm -hmm. uh, in charge of this account. Mm -hmm. And these guys have access to grind, you know. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so I, I do expect there will be jail terms for a lot of them. I mean, you know. We have Murray Hebert used to jails in uh, Malaysia, you know. Uh, you, you can maybe tell us what it's like, how comfortable it is, you know. Uh, so yeah. I think uh, some of them better get used to it. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. um, a question for both of you. Let me start with um, you, Joe. Um, Mahathir is now posing himself as a reformer and a, and a Democrat. Um, of course, he was known during his long reign in the 80s and 90s as a real autocrat with a lot of mm -hmm. repressive tendencies, also high spending on his industrial mm -hmm. um, policy, his, his hopes to develop industry. Um, and of course, he built up Omno into uh, mm -hmm. what it is today in many ways. So Najib, in many ways, was playing by Mahathir's playbook, mm -hmm. although perhaps mm -hmm. he went a lot further on, on the corruption. Um, Mahathir, in, his, in this recent interview, he has not apologized for any of his past policies or, mm -hmm. or tactics, um, but he now is promoting this sort of institutional reform agenda. And we have seen some early moves that have been mentioned already, the repeal of the fake news law, um, the repeal of the, of the, of the GST, the, the goods and services mm -hmm. tax, a uh, pledge to rein in spending, which will be interesting to see from, from Mahathir. But do you think Mahathir has really changed? Do you think he can really become the leader of a new, newly democratic Malaysia? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and I fundamentally on this one agree with Meredith that you have to ask yourself fundamentally what has changed, you know? Uh, fundamentally, you're still going to have, you know, 
very much race-based system, mm -hmm. class-based system, you know, with uh, Bumiputra, pro-Bumiputra policies, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, with huge role for state enterprises. And so that's going to take a long time to mm -hmm. change. As far as individual personalities, I mean, it's clear Anwar has a lot of friends in the United States. He <coughs> is beloved in Georgetown, sites, and uh, he has tremendous amount of experience dealing with Americans. And so I think we need to take, I don't want to say advantage of that, but make sure that we have a ongoing relationship and dialogue with Anwar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, similarly, I think we need to bring back uh, Mahathir from a kind of a box unfairly that we have mm -hmm. put him in. And he's very much open to that. Uh -huh. So for, for the US government, it's really it's on us to start a new relationship with Mahathir and build the existing relationship that we have mm -hmm. with Anwar. And because ultimately, yeah. those two will control the destiny of the current government. Mm -hmm. And Meredith, I, I, I want you to uh, comment on, on Mahathir, uh, if you want, mm -hmm. but also to, you know, the election obviously was more than just a clash of personalities. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, these, uh, it was about the, the, all the, the, the drivers, the issues that you mentioned. But as you've noted in your remarks and in your writing, there are deep-seated tendencies in, in Malaysia, in Malaysian democratic electoral politics um, very clientelistic mm -hmm. based, patronage based. Mm -hmm. You know, voters uh, are asked to hold leaders accountable on very narrow kind mm -hmm. of individual benefits and patronage rather than uh, broader mm -hmm. programmatic mm -hmm. policy platforms or ideological platforms. So, is this, how should we view this election in terms of Malaysia's democratic transition? Is right. this perhaps a one off like the way the the LDP lost an election, and just a few years later, they've been back in power for, for many years now? Or is this, is this a, a real transformation, do you think? So I'll start with the latter. Um, and so I've, I've been wondering, you know, there, there are arguments that in Japan you did have a, a decline of the single party dominant system without a real change in policies. I think it's entirely possible that beyond, again, that sort of list of top level institutional and legal reforms, which are fairly easy to do, it's a parliamentary decision, Beyond that, it's hard to say how deep the changes will go. I do think um, that some of those changes that will make it difficult for the system to spiral into the decline it's reached now. Um, so many had argued that, for instance, this was a clash of personalities because it was a, a, such a do or die for both sides. Mahathir, this was his chance to save his, re his record. If he lost, his reputation is gone. He will be remembered as the guy who lost, not as the, you know, Bapat Malaysia, the, the one who built Malaysia up. For Najib, he could end up in jail. So, you know, real issue there. Um, and so, I mean, I agree with, with Joe that, you know, 1MD mattered in the sense of being the spur that pushed Mahathir and others to the opposition, that made them realize the pathologies within the system. But that's only one piece of it. So I think that the changes will, will prevent that sort of venal mal malfeasance moving forward, which is definitely a good thing. But I think the basic premises of what people look to for their politicians might not change so much. So I did a survey in, through Merdeka Center um, in 2016 that asked what people saw as their, the primary responsibility of a member of parliament or of a state legislator. For a member of parliament, fewer than 1% said it was legislating. For a state legislator, zero said it was legislating. It was community service, reaching out, the personal touch. That may shift a bit. You do have many, especially on the Pakatan side, who have been really trying to encourage voters not to turn to their MP when they have you know, a snake in the garden, because people do, <laughs> or clogged drains. You talk about Long Kong politicians, drain, drain on clogging <laughs> politicians. Not to turn to the, the elected representative for that, but let them handle policy. I think we'll have some progress toward that over time, but it's not going to be an immediate change. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of Mahathir's autocrat, you know, the one thing to take faith, some, some comfort in, the prime minister is now term limited. Apart from being 93, he, or 92 or 93, he also cannot stay in power more than 10 years. So, um, <laughs> um, but, I, but I think just the fact of term limits actually do help in terms of, if, if we see one of Malaysia's real problems with governance as being the tendency toward corruption, because it's, it's easy with, with the extent of, of poorly scrutinized, highly opaque GLCs, state, uh, various forms of GLICs, state-owned enterprises broadly, uh, Patronus as a slush fund, the enormous 
mushrooming of the prime minister's department as a part of the federal budget. I think it got up to like 6% or something of the entire budget, more than, than the allocations to Slangor, the richest state. Um, so those sorts of things, I think, will be checked by term limits, because there's not that sense of maintaining one's own base in quite the same way. Um, he did apologize, Mahathir, and then he also sort of retracted the apology, saying, oh, that's just a, you know, a nod to Malay culture. I think most importantly, and you know, just my own perception, is that he has shown simultaneously his old autocratic ways, no matter how much he now jokes about, hey, I'm the dictator, um, but also a willingness to backtrack. So there are two key places he did this. One was the Fake News Act. He initially said it will stay. After pushback, he said, all right, maybe not. Um, and then the second was that he tried to give himself the education portfolio, despite a Pakatan agreement that the prime minister will no longer have more than one portfolio. Traditionally, under, since Mahathir, the prime minister has come to handle home and or finance as well. Now they'll only be the prime minister. Uh, after pushback, he gave that away. Somebody who I think will actually be a pretty good education minister. And can I ask uh, one more question, and then we'll open it up. Yeah. Um, the regional impl implications yeah. of this election. You've done work on Singapore, so Singapore in particular has a very, in some ways, very similar mm -hmm. um, non-competitive uh, electoral system. Um, and, and Mahathir could not resist poking Singapore yeah. um, by, by wondering aloud if Singaporean voters might also be kind of sick and tired of the PAP, which has run Singapore since uh, yeah. its independence. So do you, what are, do you think there are going to be sort of um, ripple effects in Singapore or other countries in the region? The short answer is no. The longer answer is we're already seeing some efforts now in Singapore to use this example as a spur to promote coalition building among the opposition. So the reason that I'd say no is that the opposition in Singapore now is, remains, has never shown any sign of not being much too divided. You know, so um, we have the Workers' Party, but they have their base, which has not really spread that far geographically. It's still mostly in one area. Um, it's secure, but not spreading. Um, and so unless the opposition in Singapore can form that same sort of coalition, I've argued before that a stronger civil society helps for that, Singapore doesn't have that and won't anytime soon, then um, I don't see a clear way that this redounds for Singapore. But there is a lot of worry. Um, the, I've also heard some speculation that for Thailand, uh, this example may actually discourage a quick move toward elections just because, mm. you know, the, the sort of inspirational effect of, look, another state voted mm. for a different government might be a little too risky for Thailand. Elections are risky. Yeah. Okay, let's open it up for a Q&A. Yes, right here. Could you identify yourself and direct your question to one or the other? Yes, uh, Bill Eichert, consultant. Um, I wanted to sort of drill down a little bit more into the uh, economic and business point of view of the new government. And um, I guess, you know, we will see whether Mr. Mahathir has reformed from his nationalistic ways. But I also kind of interested, you know, given the fact that we have a president who is probably described also as an economic nationalist, how that interaction, you know, Joe, if there is a, um, a meeting between the two of them, how that might play. But also specifically given how the U.S. has walked away from TPP mm -hmm. um, and, and Malaysia moved forward on TPP with other mm -hmm. partners. So I'm just kind of interested in how you think that whole interplay might occur. Should we do three questions? Yeah. Okay, we'll do three at a time. Yeah, let me go to uh, Paul next, and then, sorry, and then Marvin. I'm Paul Hare, George Washington University. Given their uh, long and complicated history, how stable do you think the relationship between Mahathir and Anwar is going to be? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question. And, and Marvin? Uh, Dr. Hutt, yeah. Thank you. It was very good. No, no surprise. Uh, Marvin Ott, Wilson Center, and Johns Hopkins. Um, just a quick note, Mahathir, it's worth remembering autocratic tendencies, all that, but he also retired. Yeah. You know, of his own volition. He was at the peak of his powers and he walked away. Uh, not too many autocrats do that. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the picture of Mahathir as, uh, as anti-American, partly earned by his rhetoric, but is a cartoon. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to the Pentagon, you talk yeah. to the CIA, very different picture mm -hmm. of Mahathir. Right. Question, uh, actually though, is on An Anwar. Uh, throw any light on Anwar's attitude towards China and, and all the issues surrounding Chinese money mm -hmm. and 
Chinese Navy, all of that. What sort of a strategic <coughs> player is Anwar likely to be? Maybe uh, on, on some of these questions on Anwar and Mahathir, I mean, let's face it, you know, uh, Anwar was impatient to become prime minister, and uh, that didn't go down well with Mahathir. He threw him in jail. And that was the you know, beginning of the opposition, really, you know, people rallying around Anwar. I cannot believe this is a stable relationship you know, between mm -hmm. Anwar and Mahathir. Uh, and, uh, I, and, and, and so, except for the age of Mahathir, uh, I mean, I, you know, initially he said, he would make way for Anwar as soon as Anwar is ready. Now he said, well, you know, it's kind of nice being prime minister again, uh, <laughs> may, maybe two years. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to imagine that two years lasting, so I think the, their relationship, their dynamic, mm -hmm. uh, is, 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 I cannot imagine it will be smooth sailing for a long, long time. Uh, Anwar's uh, attitude to China, I mean, it's, it's, it's like anything else, Anwar's attitude to everything. He has been in opposition now for 20 years. And he, you know, he has opposed, that was his job. TPP opposed. Uh, he has opposed anything that the government did. So it's hard to know what he's for, you know. Uh, and it's hard to know what he, what he says he's for. Mm -hmm. Is that consistent with his own past? Mm -hmm. I mean, his own past is also checkered, you know? He was a uh, you know, very much young populist Malay who became a responsible finance minister and then challenged too early, and uh, he became a populist once again. So I think that, you, know, you, you need to, it's hard to know for me especially you know, what does real Anwar represent? Uh, I would like to think he represents multiculturalism, uh, you know, religious tolerance. Uh, I like to think, you know, transparency and so on. So, so I hope he represents that. On Bill's question on, on this purely economic issues, uh, you know, I, I do think now, I mean, that, remember that in Malaysia, you do have people, ministers, and the level below them play a key role. I mean, I learned this when I talked with Niti and these guys, the views of Secretary General matters, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, 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 and so that's going to carry the mm -hmm. day. And, uh, and so we have to be a little bit weary about giving too much, you know, influence to ministers, I believe, you know. Obviously, when there is spending, ministers' role matters, you know, especially when there's money to go around in the constituencies. But in the issues of pure policy, I noticed certainly, when I was negotiating over TPP, it was really, you know, the level below ministers that would form the position, and it would be very hard for minister to get out of that box. So right now, I think Malaysia is one of few countries within TPP 11, now remember, is 11 because we're out, uh, that says, you know, hey, let's finish it completely among the 11 mm -hmm. and then invite US. Mm -hmm. And in that way, we don't, go, we don't need to go into headache issues like, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals, you know, and, 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 uh, and agriculture and so on, and that would make it easier. So I don't think there is any, you know, early inclination, despite what U.S. government has been saying, to invite U.S. back, except <laughs> Japan. Japan is very keen to have the U.S. back, but even Australia and New Zealand are saying, let's, let's give it a time. Mm -hmm. But I do think on purely corporate issues, business issues, I do think Malaysia traditionally welcomes American investment, mm -hmm. and it's had, we've had huge investment, especially in IT area as well as other areas. 
uh, oil and gas is the other the other example, mm -hmm. and uh, and they've all gone pretty well, mm -hmm. and and so I don't see any reason why we should now now not be more ambitious in going after bigger projects. Great. So I'll lump these as a sort of Mahathir Anwar questions and the economic ones. Um, in terms of Mahathir Anwar, I completely agree with Marvin that, I mean, Mahathir speaks um, more than he acts in some ways. Um, so there's something of a tendency for this in, in Southeast Asia. But Pat Kuhn's work, for instance, shows that you know, even at the height of his rhetoric, Malaysia still remained one of the US's key trading partners and so forth. Um, and in terms of his relationship with Anwar, Anwar, Mahathir now seems to have some chameleon aspects. Anwar started off in the late 60s as a campaigner for Malay rights and Islam. He was brought into the government in the early 80s to spearhead an Islamization program. He was ousted for being an upstart, but also for promoting IMF-style neoliberalism. Um, and so the fact that since leaving government, uh, however unwillingly, he has adopted a range of other perspectives basically just leaves us with little gauge as to what he actually really thinks at, at any given point. Um, I think for both Mahathir and Anwar, their fundamental orientation is toward uh, neoliberal economic development, including high reliance on trade and investment. Uh, we see this through the GLCs, which, as in Singapore, can be run well. They just haven't been. Um, there, are, there have been some immediate changes which suggest that there is a real drive to make sure that they're not so poorly done. Uh, they're a little bit more accountable. Um, but I, I, don't see, um, I don't see them as, um, as being in, in disagreement on those sort of large macroeconomic goals, I'm kind of com combining my categories of questions here. Um, in terms of whether, they, um, whether they'll, they'll get along, the nature of the relationship, is Paul's question. I, I think what helps is that ideology is not a strong point within Malaysian politics at this point, except for PAS. And so that leaves a lot of fle flexibility, even on the TPP. If you look at the actual discussions around it, at the time that the US was still involved, Malaysia was considering it, a lot of the opposition's complaints were not against the TPP per se, but against the process by which it was being rolled out in Malaysia, the lack of transparency to it. And so at the time, you know, there were a number of discussions, um, especially looking at, for instance, the fit between Party Socialists, which had, the Socialist Party, which had tried to ally with the opposition, and then Pakatan, was a question of, you know, how much is Malaysia actually willing under an opposition leadership to question reliance upon foreign investment, reliance upon a, a sort of top level macroeconomic focused rather than redistributive growth model. Um, and I don't see a, a big change there. Um, so that's, that's allowed for a better relationship, at least on policy terms among these major players, but also for, for my own sense that I don't think we'll see major economic change. I don't think Mahathir, I agree with you, I don't think Mahathir and Anwar will be best buddies anytime. That would be ridiculous. Um, but I think that they'll, they'll have a working relationship in the sense that they probably won't be in government at the same time. Um, Mahathir's wife and daughter have both shown that they are willing and able to work with Mahathir. Um, Open-hearted, I don't know. Um, but their, their, their self-interests on all sides rest in maintaining this coalition, keeping the transition as planned, and going forward as though they can get along, even if they actually hate each other, which might be the case. Mm -hmm. So we're, we have 15 more minutes. We can go a little bit over. Uh, so we'll take three more questions. And since I took three from this side, let me actually look at this side first for questions. Uh, yes, the woman in the third row here. Um, I'm Janet Field from George Washington University. Um, you mentioned can you use the microphone? I'm sorry, we, because we're live streaming. I'm Janet Steele from George Washington University. This is a question for Meredith. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Islam. What do you think is the future of political Islam in Malaysia now? Um, Marina Mahathir has come out very strongly against the sort of Arabization right. of Malaysian Islam, and there's certainly been a lot of complaints from other ethnic groups, non-Muslims. Non it, it, the split in PAS, the, mm -hmm. the, the sidelining of the ulama faction, the, uh, the professionals now all in, in the coalition government, mm -hmm. what do you think is going to happen? Um, do you have a question, this gentleman here? Thank you. Mike Anderson, retired Foreign Service officer. Uh, both of you mentioned briefly the impact of media on the elections. Could either or both of you comment on specifically what Malaysian regulations restricting the media, traditional media or new media, do you think ought to be changed? And what policies are you looking at to see if the government really is trying to promote greater uh, mm -hmm. 
freedom of expression. Great. And a final question? Anyone? Yes, here. Thank you, uh, Hunter Marston, Brookings Institution. Um, in his previous uh, leadership uh, tenure, um, Ahatir was a very vocal proponent of Asian regionalism and uh, particularly uh, a vocal champion within ASEAN. I'm wondering, uh, uh, on a foreign policy level, what do you see the new government's role being, particularly vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN, and is there a hope for putting a little more oomph mm -hmm. into the regional grouping? Mm -hmm. Let's start with Meredith this time, and then we'll Okay. I'm going to leave the ASEAN question to Joe as the, the more mm -hmm. foreign policy oriented person. All right, so Janet's question on Islam. Um, Ma Marina Mahathir has long been against the sort of Arabization in a cultural sense. Um, I think um, w there are two ways of understanding the role of political Islam moving forward in Malaysia. One is that it is still there, but it's a highly regional issue. Um, and so these elections made that very clear. So I think competition in Tranganu and, and Kelantan in particular will revolve around Islam. And that is where PAS has the largest share of Malay votes in the peninsula. But again, it's regionally concentrated, and so I think we'll see this as a, as a consistent voting block. We will not have what I had previously thought we would have, which is a two coalition system in a sort of standard sense. I really think we'll have these four different c collections. On the federal level, though, I think for a couple reasons, there'll probably be less emphasis on things like the hudud as a sort of dangling stick or carrot, depending on your perspective. Um, and the, the two reasons are, number one, those votes are all in pos and not in, in the opposition anyway, but also the Sabah and Sarawak factor. So uh, Sabah, for instance, uh, Sarawak, the population for the two states is somewhere around one third Christian. It might be a little bit less now, but it's a really different demographic from on the peninsula. And Sabah, Amno had moved in. There's been higher uh, levels of conversion uh, and, uh, to Islam and, and migration of Muslims. Sarawak, though, has not made Islam the religion of the state, for instance, and has pushed back really aggressively against Islamization of the state in a formal sense, even when under Malay Muslim leadership. Um, and so that has been, these, these recent cases around religious freedom have been major factors in Sab and Sarawak's especially grandstanding of we might leave the coalition, we might leave the coalition. So I think that the need to maintain that Sabah and Sarawak factor for votes I think will help bolster what I already see to be a pretty secure Pakatan commitment to not, not restricting religious liberties more than they already are. And those were some of the first statements that members of the coalition made about restoring and respecting minority rights. The question of media, um, I'd say there, there are three key areas for change. One is that, that ridiculously bad fake news act, which I think will be repealed. Um, the key parts that, that should be addressed in terms of problematic reporting, those are already covered by other laws, um, which probably won't be repealed. The second would be the Printing Presses and Publications Act, the Multimedia Act. I don't think that those will be repealed, and actually Janet's the better one to answer on this. Um, but I think that there'll be some of the, the, the more problematic provisions around licensing, for instance, will be, will be lessened. And then the third aspect, which is a much harder thing to change, is ownership. So right now, the ownership structure for Malaysian mainstream media is essentially all by BN parties. And that's part of the reason why we have more um, more vibrant and, and quite distinct online news from, from mainstream news is, is the ownership. What could be a problem, though, and what Malaysia Kini, for instance, has already started to put out some you know, feelers about, is how to sustain independent media once the mainstream media loosen up. So there's already been some talk of changing uh, from the party holding companies' ownership of mainstream media, of selling off some of that or relaxing their provisions so that maybe somebody will actually read or listen. Um, but that may actually make for a more challenging competitive environment for the online independent media. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I completely think, agree with uh, Meredith. I think this election has, at least for now, really stopped further Islamization of mm -hmm. Malaysia. And I think that's probably the, one of the most important results uh, that we could have. Uh, on, uh, on Hunter's question on uh, Asian regionalism, you know, I think ASEAN has fallen into a really sad state. Uh, it, there is no leader among, among ASEAN. You know, I mean, to the traditional powerhouse, Indonesia is really absent. Same with Thailand, completely absent. Philippines completely absent. And so you see this annually, you know, when they have uh, the summits, that there is no clarity. And whoever is the chair just runs with it, does whatever they like. 
and in the end, everyone is, you know, vilified as a result. So even if you're Laos, you run with it, you know, uh, and and so on. So so it's it's really in a sad state. Will this election make a difference? Well, I don't think so. You know, uh, I I don't think it's 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 you know, they have give, given enough thought to ASEAN as an institution. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, non-factor within the election. So I, I think, uh, is it, I mean, is there anything that can be done? Uh, you know, maybe emergence of a strong leader with, who is respected regionally can make a difference. But I don't see that uh, Mahathir or Anwar is putting any priority into building, uh, kind of building on the existing uh, architecture. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that, that um, they, the Mahathir government has not yet appointed a foreign minister, yeah. which I think really shows that the foreign policy issues are not the priority of this government or the, probably the national conversation right now. It's very right. domestic focused, and I, right. I don't expect we'll see right. any, right. as you indicated too, Joe, maybe slight rebalancing on the margins in terms of Mm -hmm. China, Japan, the United States, but I, I, we, it doesn't look like there's going to be a real focus on the mm -hmm. broader regional or, or global picture. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Thanks to our speakers. Please join me in thanking them. Thank